and welcome to Life Point Church. We are so happy to have you back with us this week. We hope that you find healing in all of God's love with this worship session. <laughs> Beautiful. 
Let's build our life around Him. Yes, Lord. And I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. And I will put my trust in you alone. And I will not be shaken. And I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. And I will put my trust so much for everything that you do in our lives on a daily basis. Sometimes we don't even see it and we don't even realize it, but you're always there. Thanks so much for being the, the rock in the center of our universe. And I'd like to pray for all those families and people who have lost loved ones to the virus. And we pray that you'll bring unity to this nation. And ultimately, you'll let everybody know how much you love every single one of us unconditionally. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Hi, Life Point, friends and family. We're so happy that you're here with us today. And if this is your first time joining, we would love for you to text hello to the number on the screen below so that we can connect with you. There's also a request prayer button in the chat area. If you use that, a member from our church can join you for a moment of confidential prayer. Enjoy the service. Okay, so many of us have been doing church, well, differently. Sunday mornings have become a bit more casual. Living rooms and coffee shops have become sanctuaries. And fellowship has a new, less personal touch. It hasn't been easy. Yet, here we are, gathering, worshiping, learning, being the church. Now more than ever, we're reminded of a simple truth. The church is not a building. It's the body of Christ. It isn't built with brick and mortar, but with faith and hope. In the midst of uncertainty, our calling remains the same, to share the truth of the gospel with a world God loves. Throughout history, the church has prospered in difficult times, and today is no different. We are still the church. We're just doing things a bit differently. I don't remember when it was, but years ago, a friend of mine gave me a copy of a message that another pastor had shared on a Sunday morning. It was a church that well, I'd never been to. I listened to the message, and it changed my life. Seriously, 
that message changed my life. In fact, it had such a big impact on me that I made copies of that message and I shared it with lots of other people. Lots of other people. The message of the thing was so simple, it was be a disciple, make disciples. Now, that's the bottom line of the message. It was at that moment that I had clarity about my life. I realized at that particular point that no matter what I ended up doing for the rest of my life, I was going to be a disciple and make disciples. The clarity of that was liberating for me. A priority for me was to follow Jesus, to grow in my relationship with him, learn more scripture, and to help other people do the same, make disciples. Scripture is really plain about this. That's the marching orders that Jesus left every Christian. Now, we have a tendency to get a little nervous about it. We feel, sometimes we feel like, ah, I'm not all that good of a disciple. We kind of get down on ourselves. And then when we think about our ability to make disciples, well, sometimes we don't feel too good about that either. Here's the thing. That's who we are. That's our marching orders. And what God wants to do is to help us to get better at both, being a disciple and making disciples. Hold that thought. I'm going to come back to it in a few minutes. You've probably heard of the Greeks, Alexander the Great, the guy that conquered all the known world at that particular time. You may not know much about ancient history, but well, you know about the Olympics, surely. And you know about some things that came out of that. You've heard of Greek. You've seen letters like Alpha and Omega, things like that. You, you've run across some of it. You may not know a lot about them, but I can tell you something that changed the world. What changed the world when the Greeks conquered the known world was they were so proud of their language that they forced every group of people that they conquered to learn their language. That had a very positive impact, which I'll share in just a few minutes. The next thing I want to do is point out the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire, when they conquered all the world, known world after they conquered the Greeks, Guess what they did? They ruled with an iron fist, and so they were so much in charge that it became safer to travel. Have you ever heard the expression, all roads lead to Rome? Where did that come from? Well, that came from the fact that the Romans, in order to keep control of everything, built roads to everywhere, all leading from Rome to wherever they conquered. Now, why would I tell you all that? Here's why it's significant. When Jesus came and shared the good news about the fact that there was now forgiveness through him, the, news about, the good news about Jesus spread rapidly. Why did, it, why did it spread so rapidly? Well, because there was a common language. No matter where you went in that part of the world, they spoke Greek. And because there were roads all over the place that the Romans had built, travel was easier than it was ever before. And because they ruled with an iron fist, well, it was safer to travel than ever before. Those things together helped Christianity spread rapidly. So at that moment in history, they were set up. Now, if, you'd try, if Jesus had come a couple of hundred years before, it would have had more difficulty spreading. Now, there was no common language. The roads had not been built. It made a difference. That moment in history made a difference. Well, let's move along a little further. As we move through the ages, we come to the 1400s, and a guy named Gutenberg decides that he's going to find a way to print things more rapidly. So he invents this movable type printing press. As a result of that, it became really inexpensive comparatively to produce documents. One of the first things that he did was the Gutenberg Bible. Before this, only the very wealthy and, and not even all churches, but churches 
would have copies of Scripture. Why is that? Because to get a copy of it, you had to get someone to spend an enormous amount of time handwriting the copy. There were people, that was, their, that was their livelihood. They copied books, and they wanted to get it right. They were, their pride was in their accuracy and how they did it. But it, because of that, it was very expensive to have a copy of any book, the Bible or any other book. Once the printing press was invented, more and more people had a copy of the Bible, and they began to read it. As they began to read the Bible, they, they said, hey, you know what? We're not really following what the Scriptures say. And so they began to, well, they said, you know what? Our church is not really following Scripture. We've kind of gotten off track. So they did some protesting and said, hey, you know, we need to follow what the Bible says. And these people who protested were eventually called Protestants. As time moved on, some of the other practices in the church changed. They, they thought, well, you know what? We want to do more singing. And so they started doing singing in the church. Now, what you have a tendency to assume is that the way we do church now is the way they've always done church. Not the case. And so when they began to do lots more singing in church, there was, they struggled with, you know, how do we do it? What kind of tunes do we use? Should the words only be Scripture, or can we write original songs? They had to work their way through all of that, and they did. And that changed the worship experience in a church setting. As we move further in history, we'll find in the late 1700s, a man by the name of Robert Rakes in England was taking a look at the, the condition of children in his country. Now, before there were labor laws, they would, just, they would take especially poor children and they'd work them six days a week. They were not sent to school. There were no such thing as public schools at that point. And they would literally work these kids to death. It still happens in some parts of the world today. But Robert Rakes was a man who cared about people. And so what he said, I'm going to do, I'm going to start a school on Sunday. I want to teach kids how to read, because that's going to help liberate them, lift them out of poverty. And the the primary motivation he had beyond helping them from a financial standpoint in in terms of their life was so that they could read, so they could read the Bible. So this school he started on Sunday, this Christian, was called what? Sunday School. From that, a great movement took off a movement toward public education, a movement for child labor laws. He changed history. A man who wanted to teach kids how to read so they could read the Bible changed history. As we move further along, we find, well, electricity was invented. What did that do to the church? Well, it made it possible for lights to be in the building, And so they began to meet at night. And it was a real novelty at first when there were lights in a building at night. It created quite a stir. Well, people wanted to come. And so nighttime services for a while were the main thing because people worked during the day and they would show up at night. And they enjoyed those services at night with the lights. They didn't have TV and radio at that time. Speaking of radio, when radio came along, Pastors began to use it to share the good news and teach people the Bible over the airs, over the airwaves. When television came along, they did the same thing. Now that we have Internet, what are we doing also? We're using the Internet to share the good news about Jesus. Now, in this last year, we've had come to the point now where we're, we're using things like Zoom and WebEx and, well, so many other programs to have face-to-face meetings with people, small group meetings, to teach people the good news about Jesus. It's just amazing, isn't it, the the way things have come along. Now, here's, here's why I say all this. These are our marching orders. It says, therefore, go and make disciples. We're not simply called to be a disciple. We're called to be a disciple and make disciples. We're to 
reach all nations. That means all groups of people, every race and every place. Baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and then teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. That's Jesus talking to us. Another verse that you're probably not that familiar with is found in 1 Chronicles, and it says this. There were, there were men from a place called Issachar. It said, men who understood the times and knew what Israel should do. Men who understood the times and knew what Israel should do. This was a particularly tough moment in the history in Israel. There was a struggle between a King Saul and, and King David, and people saw the king, that king, that David was anointed king, but was not yet king. And so people were confused. What should we do? Who should we support? And these guys were wise. They had the benefit of the knowledge of Scripture, but they had also wisdom about their culture in that moment in history. And they had the wisdom to apply what they knew to that moment in their life, that moment in their culture that moment in their history. It may or may not surprise you for me to tell you this, is that the front door to our church is our website. Almost nobody comes to our church without first going to the website. The website is the place where people begin to check out the church and try to decide, well, you know, do I want to be a part of it or not? We have a feature on our website called Chat. Literally, people from around the world and in our community will get on the chat and begin to ask questions. Just, at, you know, sometimes it's like, are y'all meeting? How are you meeting? And then sometimes the questions are just really direct. I mean, can you tell me about Jesus? Who is Jesus really? I get questions like that all the time. In fact, some of you might want to help me with that because the discussions are... Well, they're amazing. Just this last week, people from all over the world have had conversations with me on chat. It's an incredible moment that we're living in. In addition to that, we have social media, which is making a huge impact, not all of which is good, as we all know. But not all of you are on social media, but most of you are. And so what we have to do is to go where people are to leverage whatever is available, whether it be print from the printing press, electricity, radio, television, the Internet, Zoom, WebEx, chat. No matter what it is, we want to use those mediums to reach people to help lead them to become Christians. Because what is our goal? To be a disciple and to make disciples. So, we're used to doing church in a physical way, and we need it. We need to be together. But the physical church is not the only way to do church. We can also do church in a digital format. We want to offer everything that we currently offer physically in a digital format. We want to be able to help people, no matter where they are, to come into a relationship with Jesus Christ, form a life group, find a way to serve, take a membership class, have discussions, basically everything that we're doing physically, be able to do digital, in a digital format. And so what we're looking at is we want a physical church and a digital church. So, so really what we're looking for now is a digital church, a hybrid. This is the way things are going to be from this point forward. Now, back all the way up. Before the printing press, nobody had a copy of scriptures. They just didn't unless they were wealthy. You've got one. If you don't, I'm surprised. And even if you don't have a paper version of scriptures, you've got a digital version on your phone. There's an app that I refer to on occasion because it's a remarkable achievement. It's called YouVersion. I want to encourage you to go to that YouVersion app and check it out. Forty million people have downloaded it. It's in languages 
that are found all around the world. In fact, when I'm on chat talking to people from all around the world, I'll refer them to the YouVersion app and tell them more than likely their language is available on that. Here's the bottom line. I will be a disciple and I will make disciples. What do you want your life to be characterized by? When when it's all said and done for me, if somebody says, you know what? Alan said he wanted to be a disciple and make disciples. That really was who he was. But you say, I'm a pastor, and you're thinking, well, okay, that's a pastor. I kind of expect that. But that has nothing to do with it, actually. If I were repairing cars, I'd want to be a disciple and make disciples. If I were teaching in a public school, I'd want to be a disciple and make disciples. If I was a businessman, I'd want to be a disciple or make disciples. If I was a doctor, if I was an engineer, if I was, well, it doesn't matter. I want to be a disciple and make disciples. The Apostle Paul was a tent maker that God used to impact the world. He wants to use you to impact the world, too. He wants to take who you are, your abilities and gifting. He wants to put you together with a team of other people here at the church to impact the world. There are so many different things that you can do. You have a tendency to underestimate what can be done. But it kind of starts with being a disciple, doesn't it? And then saying, how can I help make disciples? And we'll help you do that. I want you to seriously do this. I want you, if you've never downloaded the app, version on your phone, to do it. Now, I like paper versions of the Bible better. And the reason I like a paper version of the Bible better is because of what I did earlier today. I went to my grandfather's Bible. He died about 20 years ago. And I, I look in it. And see what he underlined or what notes he wrote. Or I looked at my wife's mother's or father's Bible and I see the notes that they took, the places they underlined the Bible. By the way, if you've got two kids, I'd encourage you to go buy two Bibles and write in both of them. Because I promise you once you're gone, they'll pick up the Bible and look to see what you said. The things that you underline the notes that you put the comments that you made but we live in this age and it's so incredibly helpful to not only do that but to have this and the reason I point out journey number one they have what they call reading plans that help you know where to start this particular one is unique I really like it it is a About a five-minute teaching session where someone teaches you about Mark chapter 1, and then they'll either read Mark chapter 1 to you out loud, or you can read it yourself. It only takes, what, eight minutes a day. Now, I know that you say, I'm too busy to spend eight minutes a day, but no, you're not. You've got eight minutes a day. Just turn this thing off in terms of the distraction that it creates for you and focus it from something good for about eight minutes a day, and it'll help you to grow in your relationship with God. It'll help you to be a disciple so that you can make disciples. I would, you can even do this with other friends. You can join this and say, hey, I want to share this experience with other friends, so you'll actually do it together, and you can actually talk to each other while you do it together. That's a kind of a fun way of doing it. So the question is this. What do you want to be known for? Seriously. When it's all said and done, and they talk about you, would you like for them to be able to say, she was a homemaker, and she was a disciple, and she made disciples? He was a business guy, but he really really was a disciple, and he, he made disciples. He followed Jesus. What is it that you want to be known for? 
Sign me up for this. What are you signing up for? God, I just thank you for the fact that you're at work in our lives. And at this particular moment, I pray that you would help bring clarity. You would bring focus to every person that's listening. I pray that you'd help them to make the decision that they've never trusted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, that they would trust Jesus now by saying, Jesus, I'm sorry for all my sin. I don't understand it all, but I understand this much. I've sinned. I'm sorry. And you paid the penalty for my sin. And so I'm asking you to forgive me and be the leader of my life. And for Christians who've lacked focus, I pray that you'd help them to focus in, to make the decision that they want to be a disciple and make disciples. And I pray that you'd help them to make the commitment that this week, They're going to read the Bible and spend time in prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Welcome to LifePoint Church. You'll notice when you arrive now that you will find the door propped open if the weather is permitting. As you walk in, you'll notice that our touch check-in systems are no longer there. Now we have a new system which we'll not use immediately. At first we'll not use check-in system, but soon we will be. And when that happens... Someone will ask you for your name and who all's there, and they will print out labels for you, which you'll tear off. You'll take the back of the label and throw it in a trash can nearby and make use of a hand sanitizing station, which we have right next to it. Then you have the opportunity to enter the auditorium. You'll notice that the doors say, this door in only. And this door out only. Well, the purpose of that is to maintain social distancing. We've done a lot of things to make the place as safe as possible. You'll notice that we have a lot of Lysol wipes. We have digital thermometers. We have masks designed especially for children. And we have a mask for adults. There's hand sanitizing solution all over the building. And we have a very special device installed in our air conditioning systems, all five of them. This device kills viruses. It's installed in hospitals, nursing homes, child care centers, and we now have it installed in our building. You can learn more about it by going to rgf.com. This is an incredible device that we have that's going to make our building one of the safest buildings in the city. After you leave, we have the opportunity to kill any virus that may have gotten into the building, any kind of germs at all, really by using Procure-V. We're also using Decon 30. These are the same uh, chemicals that are being used in industry, airlines, and other places like that, hospitals, to kill the viruses. We're using the same device that United Airlines uses to spray the inside of their airplanes, the EMS 360. This electrostatic sprayer is very effective at covering everything in the building very quickly to kill the virus. We are no longer passing an offering plate. Instead, we're encouraging everyone to give online or text to give. But if you come with a physical offering, cash or a check, or you can grab an envelope and you can drop it into the slot there. This is definitely a new day, isn't it? We are at a new moment, but we'll make adjustments and we'll find a way to help everybody draw closer to God and to each other. Look forward to seeing you.